Um, so we are uh, delighted to kick off this seminar series and to introduce the Locating a National Collection project. That, as um, Jen said, is part of a very nice family of projects that is the Towards uh, a National Collection, which is um, a funding scheme that um, some of you in the audience are very familiar with. But for those uh, who are not, Towards a National Collection is um, it's a major um, uh, funding scheme that focuses on the UK cultural heritage uh, sector. And some of the uh, main aims of the of the program are to dissolve or uh, I guess at least lower uh, the barriers between um, collections. And when you uh, manage to do that, of course, the searches across collections become more multi and cross disciplinary. And lowering and dissolving the barriers, of course, also means trying to make the, connect the collections more accessible to uh, different kind of audiences. And one of the principles of the, the program was that the funded projects um, had to act a little bit as sort of um, exemplar for um, other projects or other institutions and produce guidelines and best practice for others to uh, to follow. And the program had a first phase um, where um, a number of shorter term projects were funded, um, eight foundation projects were funded uh, to start um, tackling the most uh, common and recurring uh, challenges and to start um, investigating some possible approaches and tools. And as you can see from this um, slide, um, the funded projects uh, really cover a range of approaches and tools from IIIF to natural language processing and the use of persistent identifiers. By the way, if you are curious about um, the progress of the foundation projects, you can access all the interim reports on the Towards a National Collection uh, website. And you can see seven uh, here and the eight was ours locating a national collection. And the aim of this project was to use location as a way of connecting uh, different collections, but also uh, as a way of engaging audiences with uh, cultural heritage. And the project is uh, a collaboration between different institutions. The PR principal investigation is Gethin that is gonna talk about the project to just in a few minutes from the British Library. The co-eyes are um, Liffy Saxon from the University of Exeter, Alex Hunt from National Trust, Anthony Musson from Historic Royal Policies, and myself, I am the postdoctoral researcher um, on the team at the British Library. And uh, we also had some data partners um, and the nature and sometimes the heterogeneity of our data partners, um, you know, became an important part of our work and we will discuss this um, in, a, in a little bit. Uh, the project had two main work packages, one focusing more on engagement, uh, during which we wanted to, uh, to explore and to understand better uh, the needs, the expectations and the motivations of the stakeholders of the collections, uh, with stakeholders meaning both the cultural heritage professionals and the audience. There is also a more technical work package, but we won't be discussing that much um, in, this, in this seminar. And um, for me, I mean, thinking about um, places and uh, items in collections and how they are relevant to people, um, it all pretty much boiled down to three main questions. And one was, can we actually use location as a bridge to connect resources in different collections? And there were some encouraging precedents in this sense, uh, like, for example, the, the work done by the Pelagius project. But we also, I mean, identified, that, identified a few more challenges there. But also, can we use map-based interfaces as um, interesting and useful ways of browsing and searching the collections? And last, can we use place references also as, way to, as ways to create new paths of engagement with cultural heritage? 
And we decided that instead of you know, asking these questions to each other, uh, sometimes researchers do, it would make much more sense to ask these questions to our stakeholders. So we started with a series of interviews with culture heritage professionals, and then we commissioned a quantitative and a qualitative uh, audience surveys that uh, Gethin will discuss later. And I will start with uh, what we learned from our interviews with GLAM professionals. Um, and we focused on two kinds of profiles. Uh, one that was more technical, so we tried to talk with people that had a very good understanding of the process, uh, the processes of acquiring, curating, managing uh, metadata, and in particular location data. And one more uh, strategic, uh, so people that had more an expertise in managing and delivering uh, the cultural content um, to, to the public. Um, we tried as much as possible to include different kinds of organizations. We had libraries, we had archives, um, historic environment organizations and museums, um, and to include uh, different you know, sizes of organizations and also organizations at different stages of what we called uh, their digital journey. Um, and um, it was um, it was quite complicated to um, to uh, do these interviews, which is why I want to take this chance to thank once more the thirteen people that participated to these interviews that belong to uh, the organizations that you're seeing in these slides. Uh, because I mean, on top of the usual uh, constraints of time and resources, we were really in one of the worst moments of the pandemic, and many of our colleagues in culture heritage were actually furloughed. So we really, um, it, it was not easy, and we really appreciated all the support that we got. And 13 uh, interviews are definitely not the basis for broad generalization, but we think that we we definitely uh, got uh, some very good insights from, from them. And some of the things that we learned during those interviews, uh, we were able to, um, um, let's say, to, to use again in our um, survey, in our audience surveys. So some of the things that emerged um, in, in our conversations with our colleagues uh, were that different kinds of organizations have different relationships with location and location data. And location is um, uh, maybe, you know, it's, it's self-apparent, it's very important, it's crucial in organizations like the historic environment uh, ones. And that is because basically, I mean, place is the object of, you know, in their care. So they tend to have very good GIS expertise. They know how to record coordinates. They have institutional systems to manage uh, those records. And yet we found a little bit of a lack of standardization, especially across different uh, organizations. Uh, while um, archives and museums at both national and uh, regional level, they um, also, of course, value uh, information about location and place, but they tend to record it more in text format, so uh, like toponyms. Um, and even more than the uh, other organizations that we discussed, they suffer from a lack of standardization and very often uh, patchy coverage as well. But we also noticed that uh, for you know, smaller local museums, sometimes the approach to cultural heritage is still um, very much, uh, how to say, analog. Uh, so location information in many cases still sits in uh, card indexes. So some, uh, another thing that we asked to our, um, to our colleagues in different um, cultural heritage organizations was to guess why were the motivations that brought the users to their uh, resources. And um, these uh, informed guess were based on sometimes user data that had been collected. And some other times, most of times, it was based on a more anecdotal experience of you know, people that, I mean, did this uh, job for a long time. And among the motivations that they mentioned, we focused on three of them that really seem to have you know, a strong connection to the concept of location and place. And one is local identity, 
so according to our interviewees, it seems that um, uh, people tend to relate more um, with items and stories that are connected to the place where they live. That is probably because it helps them feeling part of a community. Um, but also proximity can be a motivation. People tend to be interested in things connected to their current location. We could be, again, where they live, but also a place that they're visiting or simply, you know, a place where they are, you know, taking a walk. And uh, such kind of proximity could, for example, be associated with GPS uh, locations. And last memory, uh, there is a very really strong motivation uh, for people to um, look for things related to the place um, where they're from or their family uh, history. Another very interesting question that we asked uh, to, our, uh, to our interviewees was to uh, design their ideal, their dream uh, map-based interface without worrying about any constraint of you know, money, expertise, um, or, or other resources. And we were you know, slightly surprised that actually instead of you know, mentioning the fanciest uh, feature, what they all asked was something simple. And they explained that that was mostly because they thought that their current search interfaces worked reasonably well for expert audiences, uh, while they were much more frustrating and discouraging for less expert uh, users. They also dreamed of a single place where they could, you know, find all uh, re relevant resources uh, after a search, uh, which, uh, you know, apparently is not that much of a given. Uh, but they were very clear about, you know, this idea of simplicity of not having overwhelming uh, pages. A few of them mentioned the idea of layers, and they use this word sometimes with slightly different meaning, sometimes meaning different levels of access to information, like having a simpler version for people you know, with less expertise or, or less time available, and then um, a, much, a, a richer, a more in-depth version of the same thing for people with more expertise or more time. Others meant layers as ways of um, let's say, filtering uh, the information thematically or maybe uh, chronologically. But they all said that they would have really welcomed having and um, visualizing connections between items within the same institutions and even more excitingly, you know, with other uh, institutions. They said that this would stimulate some sort of, you know, curiosity-driven exploration of the collections. And one interviewee uh, uh, mentioned specifically a sort of Wikipedia feeling where you keep uh, following the links just, you know, according to your interest. And these comments were obviously very encouraging for us because we were exactly uh, looking at uh, what kind of value uh, we can add through the connections. And given the nature of our partners and data partners, we were looking in particular to uh, the connections that we could establish uh, between places, like for example, you know, castles or palaces or abbeys that are in the care of for example, the National Trust or English Heritage and items in collections and in libraries like manuscripts or archeological uh, finds. And um, actually this kind of, um, let's say mutual enrichment, mutual um, contextualization between places and objects is something that is uh, quite familiar uh, to anyone who has worked with um, ancient heritage like myself and Gatin, who is also um, an archaeologist. And it's, you know, quite a common uh, experience, for example, for uh, people membering the audience uh, to go to a very famous archaeological site like, I don't know, Pestum or Saturn Hu or even Pompeii and feeling a little bit underwhelmed or even disappointed because all they can see is basically a bunch of ruins. Uh, and how different would it be if uh, we were able to show the connection between the, you know, uh, slightly um, uh, badly kept building, uh, like the House of Orpheus, for example, in Pompeii that you're seeing in this moment, in this, in this slide, and things that were found there. 
like for example this absolutely adorable mosaic of a dog that was found in the house or this quite famous plaster cast of uh, a dying dog that was also found in the same house and a number of documents in that sit in different archives and libraries they show sketches and other documentation of how the place used to look like when it was first excavated and um I think that it's uh, easy to understand how uh, they uh, really enrich each other and how uh, through the connection with the objects, the place uh, stops feeling like, you know, just an abandoned ruin. It is closer to a place where actual people lived and how the object through the connections with each other and through the connection with the place become more contextualized and they're not, you know, some sort of um, objects floating in a, in a museum vacuum. And this idea of you know, mutual enrichment and mutual um, contextualization between places and objects is something that we wanted to bring to locating a national collection. And we started exploring uh, these kind of links. And I want to tell you now a story. I want to show you an example of these kind of connections. And um, I will also use it to illustrate um, uh, let's say different types of connection and what can be the pros and cons of, of both and to discuss um, how, they, um, how they also uh, became part of our audience survey. So I'm going to tell you about um, the fragments of an Anglo-Saxon Bible that are currently held in the British Library that uh, they are known as the Silfrid Bible. And the experts in the library tells, tell me that um, uh, the original Bible was produced in a place that it's called um, Jarrow Monquermouth, that used to be a very important center during Anglo-Saxon times. And then we know that um, the manuscript must have spent some time in an unidentified place somewhere in the Midlands, where it acquired some additions in red ink that you can see in, in that little uh, preview. Uh, but then the manuscript disappeared for a while, we don't know where it was, and it resurfaced um, after a few centuries in the Wallaton estate, where it had been used very in a very utilitarian way just to keep together some legal documents. And you can see uh, some, you know, uh, the titles of the legal documents inside scribbled on, uh, on the parchment. But then its value was recognized and it became part of the, of the Wallaton collection and it was then um, donated to the British Museum and then to the uh, to the British Library. So the reason why I told you, uh, you know, this brief story is to show how the connection between, you know, the manuscript and the places has already, already made this manuscript more interesting, you know, to me, to my eyes. I know where it was born, I know where it traveled, I know that it disappeared, I know that, you know, it went in, through some troubles, and then that it was, you know, sort of rescued. Uh, there is definitely a story to be told there, and, you know, it is uh, more relatable now. And all these place connections that we have identified, they uh, can be found in the metadata of, um, of the item. Uh, so um, in a, they could also be uh, quite, um, uh, you know, relatively easily um, harvested um, in an automated programmatic way. However, if we look uh, a little bit deeper into the British Library metadata, we find that the Silfrid Bible, our fragments, um, are actually related to another leaf that is known as the Greenwell leaf that, according to the experts, was part of the same original Bible. So it was also produced in the same place, and it also spent some time in this place that we don't know exactly where it was in the Midlands because it has some very similar um, uh, additions in red ink, as you can see. However, this other leaf went on a different journey and ended up in a bookshop in Newcastle, uh, where um, archaeologist and librarian Will, uh, William Greenwell spotted it being used as binding material uh, for some legal documents coming from the Wallaton estate. Um, it was uh, then also donated to uh, the British Museum and it's now in the British Library. But if we look, uh, you know, even, you know, if we go even deeper and we go outside the metadata of the British Library and we look at other institutions and other collections, 
we find in the National Trust uh, collections another leaf that is related to the Seal Free Bible because it was part of the same original Bible. And, you know, it shared uh, a part of the journey with its uh, fellow fragments. So it was in the same place in the Midlands. It has very similar red editions. It was used as, uh, you know, binding material in the Wollaton estate. We can read some more, you know, administrative uh, words scribbled on the parchment, but somehow ended up much further south in Kingston Lacey, that is an estate managed by the National Trust and is now on a long-term loan um, at the British Library. So they're now all together. So the reason uh, I, why I wanted to tell you this story is, well, in the first place, to show you how simply looking at these place connections and the connections between objects in different collections, we have basically uh, you know, already weaved a quite complex and I think engaging and interesting narrative. But I also wanted to use it uh, again to tell you about different kinds of connections that we can establish. And one, like the, the, the ones between uh, the Seal Free Bible and the places that you see in the first row, as we said, are direct connections and they could be to a certain extent automated. However, I need the uh, input of a curator or an expert, a human being, to know that the Seal Free Bible is also indirectly, maybe, you know, after a two-step connection, also related to places like Newcastle or Kingston Lacey. So these different kind of connections that we could, we could call indirect connections or two-steps connections, they are richer, um, they enable us to tell more complex narratives, so they may be more rewarding for a certain type of user, but they're very difficult to uh, automate. So this kind of tension between, you know, direct connections uh, that are, you know, simpler but more easily um, uh, automatable and indirect connections that might be more rewarding but they need, you know, curation and cannot be automated. This tension we also wanted to bring to our audience survey. And it's time for me now to uh, hand it over to, to Gatin and stop sharing my screen. Wonderful, thank you Valeria. And now over to Gatin for the second part of the presentation. Um, hi there, um, can you see that? Yes, we can, that's great. Yeah, okay, fantastic. Well, thanks for that, Valeria. Um, that was great. Um, before I start, um, you know, I'd just like to say it's great to be presenting here at SAS as well. And, um, you know, we co collaborated with SAS last year in organizing um, the Link Pass workshop. And that's been a big influence on the project, actually. And um, that's, you know, that was really down to Valeria and Gabby. So um, thanks to them for that. And um, we look forward to more collaborations in future with between the British Library and SAS, I very much hope. Um, so Valeria has given right, an excellent introduction to the project, a great outline of how engagement with cultural heritage professionals has influenced our ideas on locating a national collection. Um, I, I, I love that question about dreaming of, a, of your dream access, uh, location-based access interface. And I dare anyone at the end to ask me that question if uh, you want to keep to time here. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it was wonderful to hear from the professionals uh, all their ideas about, about, about these interfaces. And actually, how, as Roy said, how, um, how practical they were, really. So um, I'm going to talk to you now, though, about um, the audience, audience research that the project's been doing um, following the uh, work on, on the interviews of cultural heritage professionals. And this has had two real aims. The first was to understand our audiences, so and look at their attitudes, confidence with digital technologies and the values, their values and their relation to place and geography. And, with, and the aim of that was then to look at location-based interfaces in more detail and take some of those ideas from the cultural heritage professionals and then... Uh, see how they might apply to um, particular interface ideas and how 
what audience thought about those. So there we looked at use cases, features, and um, the kind of data structures also that would be appealing. Um, and the focus is um, essentially for today on a public audience and their experience online. So I should also say that um, this work is not, I, I haven't led on this work. Um, our co-investigator, Alex Hunt, um, has, has worked on this, uh, working um, really alongside Valeria and also alongside uh, research bods who are a market research company. Um, and, um, you know, they've used the National Trust, our place, online audience research platform. And, um, yeah, so, and it's been, um, yeah, uh, it's, it's been a great experience working with research bots, actually. So the public survey work has been divided into two parts, a quantitative survey and qualitative focus group interviews. So qualitative work is ongoing. Um, and the focus today, uh, well, ongoing, it's, it's, it's kind of just being wrapped up right now, actually. So the focus today is on this um, quantitative work where we took 992 members of the general public and asked them to complete a survey around 15 minutes in length. The 992 were representative of the UK population on age, gender and location. Um, and they were selected from a larger initial group as they had um, some interest in heritage. Now, the primary purpose of the survey was to determine uh, some of the, the composition of focus groups um, in the second half and to explore topics and questions to be covered therein. However, the results are also interesting in their own right and they do offer insights, but we do have to be a little bit careful about the sample size and the extent to which those results can be scaled up to the UK population as a whole. So the initial stage of the survey sketched out the motivations and capabilities of our sample. And so just to, um, to give you a brief overview, um, you know, in terms of attitudes towards cultural heritage, I mean, call me cynical, but I was surprised at the level of interest in heritage amongst our respondents. Um, but uh, only 8% of the larger group I mentioned earlier um, were not at all interested in heritage. So that, I mean, that was really positive. And, and overall, actually, the, the attitudes to heritage amongst the... Um, the people that we've just, we've spoken to have been really positive. It's been actually really, um, in, it's been it's provided me a lot of enthusiasm um, speaking to the public in this way. So, second, technical confidence. So, several pieces of information demonstrate a high level of technical confidence amongst those surveyed. So, ninety-two percent strongly or quite agree that they feel confident searching for and finding what they want online. And in reference to uh, maps specifically, uh, we see that 98% um, you know, have some familiarity with online map services, and 65% use map services at least once a week. So again, um, that surprised me. Um, that might be a function of the fact that we are doing an online survey, um, but certainly, you know, for example, my mum must be in that 2% that have never used map, map, map services. Uh, and, and, and then we also went on to look at values. And um, when, in terms of values, we wanted to gain insights into people's relationship with the idea of place. So uh, here we first looked at that, picking up on the work in the interview, um, the, the information we gathered from the interviews, we looked at, lo at local identity. And here we find that 60% identify strongly with the place and local area that they now consider to be their home, whilst 54% agree that they feel well connected to the local community and the place and local area that they now consider to be their home. On the other hand, um, we find that 75% agreed that they enjoy a visit more if they can find out information about the history of that place. Um, but and whilst 83% agree that they're always curious to find out more about the places they that they visit. So I think these questions are really interesting and, um, and demonstrate that there might be two different routes into our work here. So on the one hand, we have this local perspective. Although the majority of people identify with their local area, a very significant minority do not. And this goes along with research that's shown 
that much of the UK's population does feel rootless. But what does the 60% figure tell us? Does this mean that those who do not identify with their local area are uninterested? Or do we have an opportunity here instead to build a sense of local identity through cultural heritage and through um, programmes like Towards National Collection? On the other hand, curiosity about new places might be an even bigger motivation. And here we're not only referring to proximity as suggested by interviewees, but also browsing, exploring and planning trips. So I think the broad headlines from this, this audience research, this survey, is, are quite positive for Tank, for Towards the National Collection, and for location-based interfaces as a whole, with a lot of enthusiasm out there for cultural heritage and a confidence with technology. Now, moving on, um, we find that, however, despite this interest, awareness of existing resources was quite low. So while 38% were aware of map functions on heritage and history websites, only 27% had used these functions. Uh, whilst, but on the other hand, 85% really enjoyed using them, which is you know very high in, if we look at that in comparison to some of the other um, map services that um, were, were um, presented. So we might conclude from this that appealing services are failing to reach potential audiences. And, you know, I feel this is quite a key early finding for the project um, in terms of public engagement. Whilst we could focus on interface, you know, on data, um, it's the promotion and visibility of these online outputs um, of, from towards the national collection is also really critical. And there needs to be clear communication that the interface exists but also that it can be used to achieve what, what the interface can be used to achieve is, is, is might be more important than interface design, really. So our survey um, also examined various communication channels across several questions. And I'm not going to get into all these in detail. I'm, you know, uh, by no means an expert in this area. But uh, in some cases, these are closely tied to location. So, um, for example, local media, 61% tend to find out about their information from the local area from local websites. And I understand here we're talking about online community forums, social media, virtual notice boards, or local blogs. And, you know, again, this is a surprise to me, and we're looking to explore this in focus groups and also when discussions with the UK Web Archive at the British Library as well. We also found that 45% use local newspapers to find information about their local area, and 31% use local leaflets or magazines. Um, on the other hand, 21% um, agreed that they are actively involved in groups and societies related to heritage. Um, and so again, that's one of these questions, is this an opportunity or a barrier? Is this an opportunity given the levels of enjoyment, given interest in heritage, are there ways that programs like Towards National Towards the National Collection, or you know, for example, Layers of London, another SAS project, could um, could actually try and improve this um, interaction with the community uh, and and and, commu and groups and societies? So, understanding of these communication channels again raises questions um, relating to digital cultural heritage resources. You know, un, um, is it enough to build these resources and expect people to come? Or are these resources really products like a lot of the exhibitions that we see, um, which are um, heavily commercialized these days? And um, do we need to look at things like user needs assessment, pathways to markets, and, me and, and more detailed ways of measuring impact for these resources? Okay, so now turning to location-based interfaces, how are, they, how are they used? Um, so we've established that amongst our sample, there's a strong awareness and use of web maps, but we found um, that it's mainly task-oriented approaches do that dominate, as, as you probably expect, um, with common uses being things like navigation, information retrieval, and tasks like planning and scheduling trips. 
So those are colored black on this slide. And although there is a great familiarity with using web apps to complete these constrained tasks, the public are not nearly so familiar with curiosity-driven or exploratory use cases. However, there are several things do point to um, opportunities in this area. Um, you know, people are using things to browse, to see what is around a holiday destination. And of course, um, this slide, which is ubiquitous amongst um, web app presentations, um, shows, you know, on um, Johns Hopkins University's um, COVID-19 map and maps like this alongside election maps in 2020 really did demonstrate uh, interest amongst the public um, the, in these more exploratory um, use cases where people um, will browse and discover information um, and, and not just do that on one occasion but come back to these um, over and over again potentially. Um, so these maps offer generous interfaces and a move beyond a hard text search box with opportunities for playful engagement. But what is yet unproven, I would say, is whether the competence in using dynamic interactive maps for our task oriented approaches can really translate to um, exploring cultural heritage objects of interest amongst the general public. And so it's that sort of barrier or, or not barrier, but that sort of div, uh, divide that I, I think towards the national collection projects can aim to bridge in that in that in that second discovery phase. So in this, in um, I th I th we're coming up to one forty. So I'll, um, I'll 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 move towards the end of the presentation now, and and say that the information presented from our survey has provided an overall context. And next, we will go on to gain deeper insights from a second round of focus group interviews. And, and it, there, we are looking to see how we can bring, um, how we can place can bring collections to life and at the same time examine why different groups might use or don't use access interfaces, what the barriers are. And to do this, we're going to look at um, some prototypes. So um, we have to apologize for the market jargon there. Um, um, it's not, not something I've been familiar with before this, but um, actually it seems to be entering my everyday speech these days. But in any case, these prototypes are basically simple um, location-based interface concepts that we show to these focus groups. And the focus groups then comment, they, they, um, they uh, um, tell us what they like, what they don't like, what they don't understand. You know, these are just simple sketches. Like here we have just sentences that we're using the survey but later things like PowerPoint slides. Um, and we would explain to the focus group participants where they would click, what they would expect to see. <clears throat> okay, and, and, to, and in order to explore these ideas, we are clustering um, potential audiences based on two uh, criteria. The first is interest in cultural heritage and the second is attitudes towards technology. So we go from low to high um, along these axes and those are based on answers to the survey, or respondents' answers to the survey. Um, and what we're trying to do here is stretch our audience so, or, or, or um, target new audiences. So we might say that um, high technology engagement and high interest in heritage would be a, a, a classic kind of cultural heritage audience, but can we actually produce interfaces? Can we produce data? Can we um, also target through media um, audience, uh, uh, other audiences that are further down this, um, that have a lower in technical engagement and a lower interest in heritage? And so our focus groups have looked at these, at, 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 different clusters within within this. Okay, so I can see Jane there um, uh, uh, suggesting that I should wrap this up. And I'll just say, thanks, thanks for that. Um, and, you know, these are the project outputs that are going to be um, coming, coming out um, over the next year or so. And finally, um, before I'd finish, I also just did want to take the opportunity to thank Valeria as well for all her work on the project. 
Um, tomorrow is our last day on the project. And um, we're uh, just, uh, we, I think we'd all like to wish her well for her new role at the Turing Institute. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you both so much for that wonderful um, tour through your project and um, particularly when you're coming to the end of it to spend the time with us today um, is fantastic and I loved your example Valeria of, of the place histories of that one bible and it, it's a really great um, insight into what these connections can do in terms of adding value. Uh, we have got some questions which I will hand over to Gabby for in a minute but um, I was really wanted to use chair's privilege to ask you a question to start off with which was i wonder if you could both reflect a bit on what it was like to do a project that was so concerned with place and space uh, during a year when everybody was stuck at home and um how you had to if you did how you had to change the project uh, to deal with those challenges okay. shall, shall i go first um well, uh, thank you for, for the question, uh, Jane, because I think it did um, impact the project uh, a lot. I mean, not only for, you know, the obvious practical uh, difficulties, as I was saying, you know, many colleagues were furloughed. So, you know, finding people to, to talk uh, for our interviews was not uh, easy. But that's also something that I think, you know, we, we picked uh, a little in the answers to the survey. And I believe that, for example, that um, uh, confidence with technology that we found to be much higher than we expected uh, might have been, you know, bumped up by the fact that we were all, you know, housebound and we all use technology much more than we, you know, used to. And, you know, Gathy mentioned this mom, but, you know, I've seen my mom becoming, you know, a, a tech whiz in, in the last year. So, um, I think that that was um, uh, one of the things. And the other was that we found that people were much more interested in their local areas than probably used to. Uh, and that also, I think, because of you know, limitations in travel. I don't know if, Kathy, you want to uh, add any other observation? Yeah, I think that, um, yeah, I mean, the first thing to say is that, uh, yeah, thanks for that, Valeria. Um, and um, the first thing to say, I think, that is, you know, COVID's had a devastating impact on many of our, our partners because their, um, a lot of their revenue comes from uh, visitors, really. And so that's, you know, and so that's obviously been very difficult for them. And, um, but, but at the same time, they've um, really, uh, you know, it's been, I mean, it's been great working with them and um, we've, we've actually managed to, they've really gone out of their way to continue to help the project, et cetera. So, um, but um, the, and, and I think the second thing has been that, I think we're all, you know, uh, everyone who's working from home anyway knows the kind of walking around the local area that you do just to try and get out of the house. And, um, and so some of these prototypes that we've worked with, have been attempts uh, have shown demonstrated how we can bring cultural heritage collections to the two people where they live and so um providing them with objects that relate to their local area and i think because of that in our in the focus groups thus far people have really it's really sparked people's imaginations and, and their enthusiasm there um, perhaps some of the um, work around heritage visits has been a little bit, has, perhaps there hasn't been as much interest in that amongst the audiences because who wants to hear about a visit to a beautiful castle when, you know, we're, we're, st we're stuck at home. So, but, you know, but it's, it's, it's difficult, you know, that's anecdotal. It's difficult to really pull out. Right, thank you. That that reconnection with locality is really interesting and to see that coming out so clearly in your research. So thank you. Uh, and I'll hand over to Gabby now, who is going to, uh, to deal with some of the fantastic questions that we've been getting in the chat. So Gabby. 
Great, thanks. Yeah, thanks, thanks both the speakers as well. That was really um, a fa fabulous start to this season of seminars. So we have um, four questions written in the in the chat so far. Please feel free to send more. We may not have time for many more than those four, but please do send more if you um, if you have or um, if you just write. I have a question. Then, if we if we have time for it, we'll call you and you can um, you can unmute and ask it yourself. Um, but the questions we have so far, um, the first question we have was from Isabel, who asked, and I suspect this is for Valeria, um, on the subject of the Dream Map interface that was um, uh, the, the 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 was asked about in in the surveys. Did anybody ask um, or suggest browsing as a starting point, complementing the targeted search um, as a way of way of using the map interface? Um, well, um, some, uh, some things that, um, you know, someone mentioned, maybe not, not specifically, uh, mentioning the action of, of browsing, but some, something that emerged was this need for an interface where you don't need to know already what you're looking for. So an interface that enables you to explore a little bit without having, you know, that, you know, that I need to find that precise document, but more uh, a playful, uh, um, a joyful exploration of the digital, uh, the digital collection. I don't know if that answered your, your question, Isabel. Thanks. Yes, it does, Valeria. I was just curious to see how people approach it. And I, I completely see that um, individuals may actually know, not know what they're searching. And then in Google, you can do that, but you get a lot of rubbish up as well. But in something that is defined as that, I think people won't have a good experience. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, so the, the second question we have in the chat is... Um, is uh, Jem Aziz was asking if the, um, if the, the research project had... Um, had a, a, re, a, a humanities question, a research question that it was asking, um, as well as asking about the, the, the about digitization and about the use of uh, of these resources. Um, I, I can say that. Um, so, I mean, I'm when when it comes to these visualizations in um, whether that's a map, a network diagram, you know, even uh, even in some cases graphs and things like that. I, what, what are the, what, what is the use of that? And, and, and that comes from a kind of relationship between the user and the visualization and, and it's a, a, back, and, a, a back and forth relationship. And I think that we are very much focused on uh, on a discovery use case as part of towards a national collection, but similarly, and and that is clicking through these visualizations to reach other web pages. But I think in you know in in digital humanities or you know just web design really, there's a, a, a real. Um, tendency to also try to create these visualizations as a focus of interpretation. And so we're not looking at the, I'm not using the, like a, a task oriented approach, if you like, or but, uh, an interpretative approach. And when it comes to cultural heritage collections, there is a danger there because of they are partial, they, we are taking a very specific um, aspect of metadata and representing that in the visualization. And, um, and, and that goes for public audiences as well as for um, research-based visualizations. And it, it, we're, we're quite interested in um, whether there is a difference between those visualizations designed for those two audiences and um, how you can provide signifiers, affordances within the visualization that um, prevents this misunderstandings about what is what is presenting. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's um that's that that's very clear. I mean the the um the question might might slightly um obscure the fact that we we of course all understand that the study of the humanities is a humanities research question in itself, but um, 
But yes, that, that, that puts that very clearly. Thank you. Um, the next question, again, I think is um, to something that uh, the Gethin mentioned that there'll be um, an open data set um, uh, output at the end. And Ariana um, simply asked, well, what, what is that data set? Um, well, uh, it's a good question. Um, that's what we're uh, we're working on that at the moment. Um, but we're talking about a JSON data set. Um, it's going to uh, be made available on GitHub. We're, uh, I think it's going to be JSON LD. Um, and what and we're looking at two kind of options for that. On the one hand, um, an option which is this local, um, which is an option associated with local. Uh, a particular local neighborhood, perhaps, or area when we haven't we haven't decided where yet, but um, and that will be a kind of I mean geo geo JSON. Um, but on the other hand, we are also looking at uh, more of a gazetteer based um, data set, and that will be the gazetteer will essentially be will be heritage visitor sites. And we're looking to, the, it'll be a, again, probably a JSON set, data set, and we'll, we'll be looking at how we can align GLAM collections with those heritage visitor sites and try to derive value for um, this, both, both types of institution through placing, say, an object like the manuscript that um, Voyeria um, described in um, is um, in in reference to you know uh, a visitor to um, Jarrow. Um, and, and from those data sets, we'll be producing the uh, yeah. Okay, I, I was going to go into this a little bit at the end of my presentation, but um, from these data sets, we'll be producing an, an interface, like a map-based interface, as a prototype to test some ideas. Uh, but uh, of, we're not. But, but that, we're not sure which one we're going to use the interface, in, or indeed if we're going to produce both. But that we're, we're that's that's on, that's we're working on that at the moment. Thank you. My my question was first. I wasn't sure whether the data set was about the user data, so the research that you've done. So, for example, the I don't know the survey results and so on, or if indeed was about the heritage record. So you clarified that it is about the heritage records. But is it going to be? more about exemplifying an approach or the idea is also to provide some authority indeed as you say in the form of a gazetteer so is it more about exemplifying some methodology or becoming a reference for example for the future um, towards a national collection program or, or, or these things maybe haven't been decided yet thanks um well i think exemplifying an approach really uh, given the Given the, the funds and, and time available, yeah, it's more of exemplifying an approach. But, you know, as ever, if people, you know, if the second phase of projects can make use of what we're doing or indeed institutions more broadly, you know, can um, that, would, that would be fantastic as well. Yeah. I'm sure they'd be really useful. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks both. And uh, the next question in the... Um, in the chat is, for, is from Naomi. I wonder if Naomi, you want to unmute and ask it yourself. It's, it's a, I'm not I'm sort of not, not sure I'm going to do justice to it if I read it out. Um, yeah, I just wondered about the word heritage and, you know, when we talk about who's engaged in heritage and it, heritage is, you know, a word that is used a lot and it's used with quite different meanings and heritage and local can also be quite politically controversial. I don't know. It's, a, it's the London elections today and a lot of the quite right wing candidates were using the word heritage in their manifestos and, you know, when a kind of local exclusivist. So I just wondered, did the survey explore what kind of um, what do people understand by cultural heritage and how that might affect how they decide how engaged they are, particularly in terms of local heritage? Do you, shall I shall I get a start uh, to this and then you and then you go? Uh, this is you know this is a very important question and there's you know very very delicate one as um, as you said um, and um, it is definitely something that came up in during the focus groups in particular and um, 
We tried, uh, especially in the composition of the focus groups, to uh, be very mindful of inclusion. Um, so we really wanted to, you know, see different perspectives. And, you know, we did, we did wonder if, you know, um, people might not feel represented by the heritage that is in the current collections, uh, for example. Um, and we had, you know, I, I don't feel ready to discuss the results of the focus group because it's still, you know, kind of going on. And some findings were contradictory, to be honest. But, um, you know, we, we tried to explore, for example, also the value of uh, contributions, like if people felt like contributing their own you know, personal family history and, you know, uh, photographs or objects or things like that as part of a sort of, you know, communal, communal heritage, uh, linking, for example, to uh, the example of projects like History Pin or, you know, or even Layers of London that was, that was mentioned uh, before. Um, personally, I didn't, I mean, I was surprised by some of the reactions and, I found that, you know, sometimes people were more interested than I would have expected in big names and not as much in, you know, everyday people. Uh, but it, it was very mixed responses. But it is a very, very important um, uh, point. And thank you for making it. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, I think you've covered that very well, Valeria. I think that also the... <laughs> In the survey, we tried when we were asking people about w w their interests, we did keep that quite broad. We also then, um, because actually, although we present, we presented what we presented here is only a, a, a fraction of the survey. And um, so we uh, did ask people, you know, about interests as a whole, you know, sports, cookery because you know for example the collections of the British Library do relate to those topics as well and there was also a lot of open questions in the survey where people could um, uh, prov uh, provide their own answers um, free text if you like and then I think it's also I mean I, I can see it's nearly two so um, I can it's also a, a function of this quantitative and qualitative as Valeria said approach so we can take a question like I presented like people feel uh, part of their local community in the first, without defining what local is, and then in the, in the qualitative, go to those same respondents to the survey and ask them in more detail about what they feel about local, locality, about heritage, et cetera. Yeah, that's great. Really fascinating. I just, I'm really interested in the subject. So they were really, really interesting responses. Thanks. Great. Um, well, thank you so much for exemplary timekeeping and for being our first speakers and getting the series off to such a fantastic start. And thank you also to everyone in the audience for the great questions, uh, which has led to a really fruitful discussion, I think. And um, we hope to see you again for more of the seminars in the series. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye. <laughs>